Hi, welcome back to Science Society podcast. This, uh, my name is Scott. My name is Anton. And today we'll be covering a topic called quantum computers and its application currently. And but before we can ex- begin, we're gonna have to explain a bit of context first, so everyone can understand each other. Okay, so we're gonna first explain about Moore's law. Uh, it Moore's law states that uh, transistors will multiply in efficiency every two years. But obviously, there's a limitation to this. There's a limitation how small the transistors can get. And we're currently already reaching it because right now the transistors are already at a nano level. But quantum mechanics will help us resolve this issue. But before we could begin talking about a bit more about that, I'll be explaining a little bit about how computers work in very simple terms, like how they use a base 2 system uh, where it comprises of zeros and ones. And which is different to how we count, which is a base 10 from 1 to 10, you know, without fingers. So, yeah. Okay, so next uh, important concept to understand about quantum uh, mechanics is, uh, uh, is uh, superposition. Superposition uh, means that uh, we cannot measure the momentum and the position of the photon at the same time. We can only measure one. So, uh, that is. Um, so it cannot, it cannot, uh, we cannot only measure one, like because if you measure one, the other one will already change. So that's a superposition. Now, by using the nature of superposition to our advantage, this leads us into how quantum cryptography works currently. As in, basically, each photon that is being sent between two parties has a certain direction, in that they could either be diagonal. Horizontal or vertical, and in this way, both parties would have to have a key, a set of keys, and filters. And I'll be explaining what filters are in a second. However, this in this way they can then communicate with each other properly. So, what are filters? So a filter forces a direction, forces the the direction of light, I mean of the photons to polarize. In a certain way, so there are two types of filters. In that, one is diagonal, and the other one is horizontal and vertical. So, with this, so with this, if uh, the alignments don't properly match, such as a diagonal photon goes inside a horizontal vertical filter, it would then forcibly forces the photon that's going through the filter to become horizontal or vertical randomly, and in this way communicates a different type of bit to the receiving end, which makes it so that the more filters you add, the more it becomes near impossible to actually crack. Okay. Uh, before we go to the uh, quantum entanglement, uh, we can go back a bit about uh, how the quantum computers work. So in normal computers, as we mentioned before, it uses two base systems, ones and zeros. But quantum computers uh, work in a bit different way. Instead of having only two, they have three options, so it could be one, zero or both so and those instead of calling bits they're called quibits that's a difference and next we're going to talk about the quantum entanglement the quantum entanglement is a theory that states that uh, molecules can change the state of another molecule even like a uh, universe array like any distance uh, instantaneously faster than the speed of light so this could be used to create a quantum network so it will be uh, very efficient because it will allow uh, photons to tell instantaneously and so it be very resistant to hackers or potential quantum hackers in the future or something. So uh, it would be a very efficient network and be very secure. So this then leads us to how quantum computers could be, as an example of how quantum computers can currently be used. So an example would be the Ebola, the Ebola breakthrough that happened, right? The vaccine for it took about five years to create due to like limiting technologies of how supercomputers back then were able to like process information. Now, and in a more recent time, as like in terms of examples, we have the COVID vaccine, which was like made in a couple of months to years where it used, they use supercomputers to make sure that like everything goes by as fast as possible as an epidemic that like everybody's facing currently. However, it is speculated that with quantum computers, 
this process of like creating a vaccine to be expedited extremely fast in terms of like a couple days to weeks even at most as their processing power is like hundreds of thousands times much stronger so what about quote unquote quantum computers so right now obviously it's a very very expensive technology it's not commercially available it's only for it's like extreme cost associated with it and the reason for that extreme cost is to make sure it works properly you have to maintain uh, temperature uh, near absolute zero not absolute zero okay uh, next uh, we can uh, talk about the, some trivia facts about quantum computers so i wanted to do a little bit of a callback to our previous science society podcast where it is mentioned in past it is mentioned about the many worlds interpretation and how quantum mechanics is kind of maybe linked to it and and there's a possible theory that is in the working but obviously it's just a nice fun thought experiment currently but to explain is that by using superposition right we can see that an electron can exist in all possible states around an atom and within all these possible states it is like a possibility of when if you actually measure it they would randomly show up in different positions on the electron itself and in this way it is suggested that each time that we measure the electron that the universe splits apart into two different re uh, at least two different realities of where the position of the electrons could be and as you can tell there's a lot of electrons in each atom <laughs> and there's a lot of atoms like a lot a lot so hence why this says that it's probably infinite amounts of parallel universes if they do exist okay so some Maybe some commonly asked questions is this. So, in the future, do you think uh, quantum computers will replace the normal computers? Will be a daily thing, like how we had like a, a computing revolution from Steve Jobs, about everybody started using computers. Do you think in the future it'll be like everybody has a quantum computer at their home? Well, I want to preface this by saying that I am no quantum computer expert, expert but I just want to say that. Currently, it seems extremely unlikely that in the future it would be commercially available to everyone, as it requires like a large amount of supercooling and like to even function properly, and even then, it just doesn't seem very feasible. But who knows? That's just science. Maybe one day we can reach absolute near absolute zero inside our home, in our living room or something. Uh, okay, let's see. What are the common questions? Uh, With current quantum com quantum computers, how well are they at running video games? Uh, currently, they are about the same, but they're not like specialized for them because if uh, if they be optimized and specifically programmed for them, because right now it's only programmed for calculation. If they actually get changed a bit to focus more on video games, they'll have a much greater output. But right now they perform about the same, but they don't even specialize for it. But if if they will be specialized for it, they'll be like hundreds, thousand times better. Uh, another quite interesting question is uh, many people, for example, nowadays is like uh, use their computers to mine Bitcoin stuff like that to like you know. Do you think it's possible to do the same in the quantum computers? Will be in the future since we're gonna transition potentially to. Uh, uh, using cryptocurrencies for daily life. Is it possible for people to use quantum computers in the future to make Bitcoin and other, like mine? I mean, I think it's not really a question about if it's possible. It is most definitely possible, but is it feasible? That's the thing. Mm. Like, if, first of all, if you own a quantum computer, I think you're better off selling it to like research institutions like NASA or whatever to like for your services I mean, than actually mine Bitcoin with how it. About, how about in like the long, obviously right like now nobody can even buy it. Like even if you we're gonna go to buy it, but I mean in the future, isn't it possible? Like if it's gonna be in ideal future when everybody can have one. I mean, as long as Bitcoin doesn't become outdated, I guess you can. But there wouldn't be any problem with that. But then you're gonna be competing with everyone having a quantum computer, which is. I know, think probably for my business mind, probably devalue all the currencies because if everybody can mine them in a second. Like, uh, so be it worthless. So maybe that be the downfall of Bitcoin in the future, maybe. Maybe. So we are a science society firm. 
Ah, yeah, science and business at all. So everything is interconnected. So, current, well, this kind of slides off the quantum computer aspect a little bit, but what do you think, do you, I mean, not really, but what do you find the most interesting about quantum computers currently? Like, I think uh, most interesting thing about them is uh, just how much better they are, like compared to the thing we have right now. Because if you think about it, like they like you know a couple of decades ago, we have like a very small computing power. Like when we used to send like uh, we used to program stuff for the space, for example, we send the satellite or something. It was a very little like amount of programming needed. It was like very simple. Then it progressed all the time, and even now, like we have a phones are much better than computers we had like 20 years ago and like those big boxes like these big rooms like so i think in the future it's like a quite interesting concept to see how the like uh, everyday use of computers is going to change because if because maybe if you not dump the full uh, uh quantum computers but maybe you can have a like a subsector with like a have a like a kind of like a sub branch or something like less efficient than a uh, quantum computer maybe that can develop for commercial use, for example, for like everyday use. That's quite interesting. Since you are a computer uh, major now, you, you transition to being a... Well, next semester, actually, next, but next, yes. Semester, next semester. Uh, in the future, would you like to have an opportunity to uh, go, go see one? Like, if, if you get an opportunity, would you like to request Mahito to, you know, go and take you to, a, <laughs> to, see, to see one? <laughs> Um, you can send an open invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, I would, I, I would, I guess I would like to see a quantum computer, but maybe not yet. I would like to see how it advances first and then actually look at it because, well, looking at it, it's just like, kind of like a Google search away. Actually, now that, I, the more that I think about this question, right, the more that I feel like I don't just only want to look at it. I want to actually like see it in functional use. So if, if the question is solely about me going to look at it, I'll say, no, I'm not really interested. I can look at a Google image for that. But to test out functionalities and see what it can actually achieve in person, I'm very much interested in doing so. Okay, so maybe next next semester, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a bit soon, but like, mm. <laughs> So. All right, uh, see that'll be about it for our science podcast for this episode. Thank you everybody for listening. Don't forget to fill out the form to get the 80 hours. Alright, see you next time. Bye guys. Bye.